All right, good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is John Dulles, and I'd like to begin and welcome you. I'm the director of the Michigan Chemistry Council, and I wanted to welcome you to this morning's program, Conversations with Michigan's Green Chemistry Awardees. As a housekeeping matter, your lines are muted as an attendee. We do encourage you to submit questions using the chat or Q&A feature, and uh, hopefully that is readily uh, apparent to you in the Zoom uh, software. Today's session is being recorded and we will make it available afterwards for attendees and others to review. I'm very excited to be able to highlight this topic and all the tremendous work being done in our state by innovative researchers and businesses. As you may know, by way of background, green chemistry is a framework for learning, design, and improvement of chemistry products, processes, and systems, which includes the following principles among others. Prevention of waste, less hazardous synthesis, design of benign chemi chemicals and use of benign solvents, design for energy efficiency, use of renewable feedstocks, design for degradation, and inherently benign chemistry for accident prevention, again, among others. Our state has its own history in promoting the green chemistry movement, and our fantastic universities have really demonstrated leadership in this area. And we are, are blessed to be joined by uh, two folks with connections in that area. Every year since 1996, the US EPA and the American Chemical Society present the Green Chemistry Challenge Awards. And in 2020, uh, we had two groups in our state that joined a list of others that received this recognition. Previous Michigan winners of the EPA Green Chemistry Challenge uh, Award winners include Dow, now Corteva Agrisciences, for Spinetoram Natural Insecticides, the production of which is now being boosted by major new investments in Michigan facilities. Uh, it's tremendous news and shows you know, the green chemistry economic potential. That same year, actually, two Michigan State University professors were also recognized for their work on green processes for production of boronic esters. And as I mentioned last year, there was two more groups in our state that received this prestigious recognition. And I'm very uh, glad they took the time to join us and tell us a little more about their work. I will give a brief introduction for both and we'll hear a little more from them about their company and their technology. And then we'll have time reserved for questions and discussion. And I know there are some really knowledgeable attendees. So frankly, I would love to hear your questions. Again, please uh, submit those throughout and we will um, bring them in at the end of our discussion. So let me just introduce our two panelists and presenters. Dr. Steve Skirlos is the founder and chief technology officer of Fusion Coolant Systems. He is a professor of mechanical engineering and civil and environmental engineering at the University of Michigan in, in Ann Arbor, where he has earned a number of teaching awards. He is director of the U of M program in sustainable engineering um, and has done work with the university's global CO2 initiative aimed at accelerating decarbonization and carbon utilization solutions. We look forward to hearing more specifically about the supercritical carbon technology that is utilized by fusion coolant systems. And Dr. Robert M. Kennedy is the chief scientific officer at Vesteron Corporation. He's also a research assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. He may uh, add to or, or correct that as well, uh, a number of other affiliations. Um, over 25 years of research management experience and has held management positions at Park Davis and Pfizer here in our state, as well as academic appointments at Columbia University and the University of Michigan. He has led Vesteron's R&D activities since 2009. So, with that, I'd like to uh, turn it to our first presenter, Dr. Skirlos. And Steve, if you want to go ahead and look forward to seeing your material and including some multimedia. Thank you. All right, John, uh, you can see my screen, I assume. Excellent. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, um, I, as John mentioned, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering, um, and I've been for almost 30 years now looking at um, cutting fluids that are used in manufacturing. And uh, typically, uh, you know, if you've walked through, uh, you know, a metal cutting facility, um, and we've got loads of these here in Michigan, um, you know, you, you smell the air, you know, uh, you, can, you can sort of feel, um, you know, the pollution in the, in the factory. And, you know, it might, you know, be, you know, hundreds of processes that look like what we have here on the screen. Um, so this is, you know, a simple drilling operation, uh, the kind of thing, you know, you might think about when you, when you think about machining. Um, 
you know, the, there's a few points that must come to mind immediately, right? If, if these uh, cutting fluids are an environmental or health concern, and, and they are both, um, then why don't we just get rid of them? Um, and folks have tried that uh, for, for decades upon decades. And, and, and the fact is that, you know, a drill that might be two or three hundred dollars um, that's putting a hole into titanium, which um, you know, may cost tens of thousands of dollars. Um, you want to make sure that that process is smooth, that that process is repeatable, um, that the surface finish, the quality of the holes are good and the tool doesn't snap in the middle of the process. And it is very difficult to achieve that at high rates without some form of coolant and lubricant in the system. So these emulsions, uh, you know, they're emulsions of water and oil accomplish that, right? The water in the emulsion does the cooling, the oil in the emulsion reduces friction and prevents heat from being generated. And you know the combination of those two functions then allow high rate machining. Um, so they're absolutely necessary uh, emulsions, and they come in different kinds, uh, synthetics and straight oils, et cetera, et cetera. But it's basically the same story. You've got some cooling and some lubrication. Now, if you're gonna bring oil and water together in particular, which is done in the predominant of cases, um, you know, you just got a whole host of issues, right? These emulsions are inherently unstable. You know, I spent about 10 years, got a PhD studying uh, microemulsions, nanoemulsions, you know, how to emulsify these systems, stabilize these systems, and recycle these systems. And it, it turns out it's a complicated system. There's about 20 chemicals that are necessary to, to make, you know, this simple cutting fluid. And, and ultimately, they are disposed. Um, and, and um, you know, obviously they mist, so people are breathing these um, materials as well. So, and so the upshot is, you know, um, around the world, it's about a $10 billion industry. Um, you know, the costs vary a lot, um, but in a lot of cases at the system level, the metalworking costs, uh, the fluid costs are higher than the tool costs. So you're spending more on the fluids themselves than say the drills or the mills or the inserts, etc. So there's a cost issue here. Um, there's also a, a human health issue. Um, you know, you can read the industrial hygiene, hygiene literature. Um, there are serious uh, cancer risks. Um, you know, hypersensitivity, pneumonitis, sort of lung issues, um, uh, allergic issues in the skin. And then, you know, you might be machining leaded steels and now you get a lead pickup in your cutting fluids. Now that lead is going to end up in, in the environment, right? Um, lots of different environmental issues uh, uh, from, you know, the oils themselves to the metals in there. Um, nutrient loadings, etc. So, you know, it's really a sort of a, a trifecta of cost, environment, and health issues. So if we're going to move forward from a sustainability perspective, you know, we want to reduce the, the inherent health and safety risks. We want to reduce the emissions to the environment. And, you know, there's nothing sustainable about systems that don't work. So we also need a high performing cutting fluid. Um, and so let me turn the sound off here. I apologize. Okay, so um, what we came up with was a use of supercritical CO2 to deliver tiny amounts of oil, really oil of any variety. It could be vegetable oil, uh, petroleum oils, etc. And we're basically moving from the top process. What you're looking at is the production of a hip cup. So this is a, a biomedical implant that's going to go in somebody's body. Um, these can be made out of straight metal. Often they're made from 3D printing. Um, and you can just imagine trying to clean, you know, particularly the 3D printed, the porous part, you know, that's got all this emulsion in it, you know, before it's going to go in the body. Um, so in the bottom example, um, we are actually delivering supercritical CO2, uh, rapidly expanding out of a nozzle with no oil in it at all. 
So, um, you know, what we've got here is an idea to use supercritical CO2. Now, people tried liquid CO2 forever. Um, they've tried liquid nitrogen. There are um, challenges and impossibilities associated with using those strategies. And, you know, after 10 years of work on the emulsions at the top, you know, I just, you know, one day woke up and said, has anybody tried supercritical CO2? Maybe that will work. And, and the real shocker was not only does it work well when you deliver oil, tiny amounts of oil, uh, invisible amounts of oil, like two milliliters per hour up to 30 milliliters per hour, like tiny amounts of oil work really well, much better than the emulsions at the top of the screen. But you can actually eliminate the oil and for some reason, supercritical CO2 works better than liquid CO2, even when there's no oil involved. So, um, and not only is it cleaner, we can machine faster. You know, the, the tool set will last longer. The metal is brighter. The tolerances are better. It was a total shocker. Um, and I'd been working in cutting fluids for more than a decade. And, you know, part of the work that I did was develop and revamp testing of cutting fluids. So, you know, the sort of standard testing for cutting fluids actually came out of my lab at Michigan. And when we tested supercritical CO2, it broke our own tests. So, um, you know, we knew we were on to, you know, sort of a cleaner, uh, safer sort of solution. And, you know, we, we set out to, you know, try to figure out why. And in, in this particular um, image, you're looking at um, liquid CO2 at the bottom, the bright blue, with a drop of oil. So what you see here is that oil does not um, dissolve within liquid CO2. And this headspace is just gaseous CO2. And, um, you know, this system as a cutting fluid doesn't work. And there's, there's a couple of reasons. One is when you um, release the pressure and you direct the, a, a nozzle toward a metal cutting process, you've got this gas CO2 sort of fighting with the liquid CO2. So the flow isn't very steady. And second of all, this oil doesn't know what to do um, if you add oil. Uh, you know, it doesn't dissolve, so you get this very unstable clogging and, um, you know, sort of randomly performing process, okay? So um, I want to show you the video of what happens when, you know, we just go from liquid CO2 pressures to supercritical CO2, you're going to see a one-phase system, of course, and you're going to see the, the dissolving of that oil. So, you know, the upshot of this discovery was, okay, a one-phase system is better than a two-phase system. So even if that oil isn't there, this is going to perform better than a liquid CO2 system. You know, the second secret sauce here is if you add that oil, you're going to perform much better um, than even an emulsion will because that oil is going to leave that compressed state and um, it's going to be more effective in terms of lubricating a process. So um, I'll just finish up here by showing you, you know, this works in drilling. Um, it works in milling, if you're familiar with that, or turning all kinds of metal working operations. You can apply this basic concept to and you apply it the same way you would apply a normal emulsion. So it's pretty much a, a swap out of high pressure emulsion from super, for supercritical CO2. The changes that you have to make are actually quite minimal. Um, the results, you know, here in this uh, image, you see a high pressure emulsion um, in drilling. You know, we could, um, you know, increase the material removal rate by 11 times and increase the tool life by 200 times, right? This is in a, in a small drilling operation. Or in a milling operation, you know, compared with emulsion or liquid CO2 or liquid nitrogen, we could increase, um, you know, the tool life by, you know, more than 600% when, you know, just the test was stopped. So you have a very 
high performing fluid that is you know quite easy to um, integrate into a machining system. You know, you've got your liquid CO2, you pressurize it to supercritical, maybe inject oil if you want to do that. You get recyclable chips, uh, you get a clean air environment, you eliminate the water pollution, um, minimal or no amounts of oil, um, longer tool life, faster machining times. Um, it's quite a quite an interesting value proposition. Um, we are uh, we've got traction in Japan, uh, Western Europe, Canada, Mexico, uh, the United States, and um, you know we're currently um, you know uh, raising money now to uh, create a, a truly global system or, or company here. Um, so in medical and aerospace, automotive, uh, heavy equipment, micro machining, additives. So we've got applications and a lot of different manufacturing environments. And I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and turn it over to Robert. Thanks, Stephen. We're gonna bring in Robert now and hear about his company, Vesteron, and their uh, biopesticides. All right. Go ahead if you want to uh, click the start presentation or F5 and take okay. it away. F5, you say. You're, you're all set. OK, so if you can see my screen now. Yep. Fantastic. So it's a, uh, really a pleasure to be here. It, it, it's and it's it, it's exciting to learn that Michigan really is a powerhouse when it comes to this award. Um, uh, Vestron is a biopesticide company. Um, we are working with peptides. Uh, we have now launched our first biopesticide product, Spear, and it's actually the first uh, insecticide uh, to come along since um, the Michigan uh, 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 innovated. Uh, Spinosad uh, in uh, biopesticide some uh, many years ago, I think approximately 20. So uh, it's exciting to follow in those footsteps. Um, uh, we believe at, at Vestron that a shift is needed in crop protection um, uh, generally, uh, specifically here in uh, control of insects. Um, uh, the, uh, the history in this industry has been synthetic small molecules. Um, they're, they're really quite effective uh, but there are some concerns. Um, there's environmental damage, um, harm to beneficial insects, uh, uh, most importantly, pollinators, um, as you may be aware. And then, of course, um, uh, the potential for residues that can affect consumers and the people working in the fields. Um, it has become increasingly difficult to commercialize new uh, insecticides, uh, specifically synthetic insecticides. Uh, development costs um, have skyrocketed, uh, much as drug development costs. Uh, the last two major launches of uh, uh, synthetic insecticides were pulled from the market post-launch for safety considerations. Uh, and uh, there's just an increasing burden of regulatory hurdles uh, in this area, uh, to the extent that there's actually a fair amount of consolidation in this industry around uh, these challenges. Uh, all the, at, at the same time, uh, insects continue to evolve resistance and uh, growers need new and effective tools um, to protect their crops. Um, our vision uh, at Vestron is to work with peptides. Uh, we believe that we're leading a, reg uh, a revolution in this area. Uh, we're, we're committed to providing uh, uh, growers with novel and effective chemistries. Uh, to echo uh, one of Stephen's points, that uh, you know, if it's friendlier uh, to the environment, but perhaps doesn't work, that is not a solution. And so um, we're one of the uh, first to come along that we believe match the uh, control of synthetic insecticides. And at the same time, providing this improved safety profile for workers, beneficial insects uh, and the environment generally. Um, our first product, Spear, uh, uh, was first recognized in 2015 um, in an award from the uh, International Biocontrol Manufacturer Association in Switzerland 
uh, as the um, inaugural um, novel biocontrol. And then here subsequently in 2020, um, uh, from the EPA's Green Chemistry Challenge Award uh, for uh, novel um, biocontrol solutions. And I'll uh, take a moment here to tell you a little bit about our product. First of all, we've uh, decided to move to peptides as opposed to secondary metabolites or synthetic small molecules um, because they simply have a better profile. Uh, these peptides uh, tend to be much more selective and do not have off-target activity against humans, mammals, fish, birds, uh, et cetera. Uh, this safety has been recognized by the EPA um, uh, in uh, providing us with no pre-harvest interval. Uh, we can uh, spray the crops and then harvest them the same day, which is important uh, for the growers. Uh, it's sustainable. We produce our product by fermentation, uh, which is fed sugars as opposed to using fossil fuels as an uh, input uh, for manufacturing these products. Um, and so this is a truly sustainable agricultural practice. Uh, we have found that we have the same efficacy as small molecule synthetics, and we have a true uh, interaction of our peptides with a target. These are not diffuse, un, uh, un, uh, mis, uh, uh, poorly understood interactions. These are clearly understood interactions with the target. And we believe because they use us a, a broader footprint that um, uh, uh, this results in greater selectivity, which um, uh, may help uh, as well in preventing the emergence of resistance to these products. And so we believe that this uh, type of product it, uh, it exists uh, between two types of uh, previously commercialized products. Uh, synthetics, uh, very expensive uh, to develop. Um, uh, costs to develop a synthetic are, are well north of 300 million at this point. It takes 10 million, uh, 10 years to bring them to the market. Um, uh, there can be some problematic aspects to safety, uh, uh, which is a, a, a regulatory concern, of course, but they are really quite effective. Um, uh, up to 95% uh, efficacy in the field and are stable in the field. And because this is uh, synthetic chemistry, um, the costs uh, to produce these active ingredients are relatively uh, uh, low. Microbials, on the other hand, much uh, uh, cheaper and faster to develop um, and have excellent safety profiles because of their specificity. Uh, but the um, uh, uh, historical insect control is much lower and um, they are uh, unstable in the field, not always consistent with existing agronomic practice, um, and, uh, uh, can, and can be very variable uh, from product to product. We think peptides marry the best aspects of both of these, um, being uh, efficient to develop from a cost and time perspective, still provide that excellent uh, insect control uh, and uh, good scalable uh, production costs, um, uh, and uh, have a, rel uh, a very good uh, stability uh, in the field. And so uh, we think that this is the future of uh, agricultural practice, and uh, we're really quite excited about this. In order to bring forward this product, we had to solve three major um, gating problems. First of all, we had to be able to produce these products. Uh, when I started, we were making about 10 milligrams per liter in fermentations, and we are now making 10 grams per liter. So we now have um, industrially scalable processes. We also had to formulate these um, peptides such that they generated bioavailability in the insects. Um, and so we had to uh, 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 develop uh, formulations that penetrated uh, these insects, and we have accomplished that. Uh, and and uh, finally, uh, nobody had ever commercialized one of these products uh, and had gone through the regulatory process uh, to get them de-risked and onto the market. And we now have an efficient regulatory path for bringing these products to the market. And so our first product, Spear, uh, is uh, it's a peptide. It's a specific type of peptide. It's a so-called cysteine not peptide. These cysteines cross-link and stabilize the structure of these peptides such that they're much more stable than uh, proteins or typical biopesticides. We have a novel mechanism of action that is well understood. Uh, and novel modes of action in this neuromuscular class um, have typically resulted in products that have realized sales of a, a billion dollars a year. We have a broad pest, uh, spectrum of activity against um, uh, Lepidoptera, Coleoptera, and Diptera, or flies, um, uh, caterpillars, and beetles. Uh, and we have no activity against um, vertebrates such as humans, mammals, birds, fish, 
uh, et cetera. Uh, we're sustainable by virtue of the fact that we produce these by fermentation and um, the, uh, the safety as demonstrated by um, uh, uh, toxicity tests um, uh, required by the EPA have resulted in uh, a, a zero day pre-harvest interval and a four hour for re-entry of workers in the field. Um, and we have no phytotoxicity. We have two lines of product utilizing this active ingredient, Spearlep for the control of caterpillars and then spear tea for the control of insects uh, in greenhouses, thrips, spider, uh, thrips, uh, spider mites, aphids, and white flies. These are the top four um, uh, pests in glass houses. We have uh, uh, a fairly uh, robust pipeline. Spear is our first product. It is now on the market now for a year. Uh, and I believe that we accomplished sales in the range of 4 million, which is uh, exceeds expectation for a first year launch of a biopesticide. We have other products that are in development, uh, also novel modes of action, uh, different from SPEAR and different from each other uh, that we believe um, uh, will compete well with the existing synthetic uh, small molecules on the market and provide growers with new tools um, for the protection of uh, food crops. These biopesticides are actually more potent uh, than any um, insecticide that has been commercially launched to date in the picomolar range uh, of activity. These are LD50s against, uh, as injected against house flies, uh, and you can see that there are orders of magnitude that differentiate these products from the existing synthetics on the market. So these are uh, true uh, insecticides. Uh, it remains for us to formulate these so that they are effective and consistently effective. Um, and our recent uh, sales in the market uh, have demonstrated that. Uh, and, and so we believe that we have a, vi a, a bright future. Uh, Vestron uh, is 40 employees. Uh, we incorporated back in 2005. Our headquarters, our corporate headquarters are in Research Triangle Park, uh, but our research site is here in Kalamazoo for over a decade. We're backed by a number of uh, investors, most recently uh, uh, North Pond, um, a, a, a crossover investor from um, um, the biotechnology space, as is Novo Holdings. And then we are uh, also backed, for example, by more local uh, venture investors, Open Prairie and Cultivian uh, here in the Midwest. We do have uh, strategic investors such as Syngenta, Wilbur Ellis, and Continental Grain Company. Uh, I've been with the company for 10 years, but uh, one of um, uh, my, uh, uh, I, I would say, uh, proud successes is that we were able to recruit Anna Rath uh, to Vestron uh, three years ago, and she has built out uh, an outstanding executive team, uh, bringing in a new CFO, as well as uh, building out the whole commercial side of the organization uh, with uh, sales, marketing, regulatory affairs, manufacturing, and then, uh, of course, business development. Um, uh, our current focus is on these cysteine-rich peptides for insect control. We actually intend to redrug all of the major synthetic insecticide receptors with these um, uh, more environmentally friendly class of molecules. However, in time, I expect that we will uh, turn our focus on uh, to uh, antifungals and antimicrobials, um, possibly animal health, uh, and that these may even extend in, into applications in pharma. So that's uh, Vestron and our first product, Spear. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have for me. All right, thank you. I think we're <clears throat> gonna come back and get to some questions. And I want to... Um, Appreciate uh, or give my thanks to both Steve and Robert for giving a very interesting introduction there. And, and hopefully now we can uh, get, get some uh, questions and uh, themes uh, that we can learn about green chemistry and their work. So let me bring back in uh, both of them via video if they wouldn't mind. Okay. Yep. And I guess one of the first questions I would have is just very general. Uh, you've been, both been at this work with uh, this kind of technology for more than a decade. And uh, what trends or evolutions have you seen basically um, 
in in your each of your space? Um, and is it commercial? Is it regulatory? Is it um, you know what's driving some of that? So I'll start with Steve, if you wouldn't mind. It's interesting. Um, as, as Robert was talking, I was uh, drawing a lot of parallels about the structure of two very different industries. I think one of them is, um, you know, maybe um, not a predominant culture of innovation uh, that, you know, that the new technology is swimming up tide against is sort of the status quo, which is, I think, a common issue. Um, but maybe um, more so than, you know, we see over in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, the cutting fluid sector is, um, you know, almost a century old. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest um, change uh, is really, I think, the environmental awareness over in Europe, uh, which, you know, benefited our company. Uh, so, um, you know, we spent a lot of time building traction in Ireland, uh, to start, um, Sweden, uh, Switzerland, Germany, France, um, uh, then Spain, you know, where, where the water issues are, are great. And only after, you know, having, you know, that traction over there, um, you know, did we really start to make inroads, uh, in, in the U S um, particularly in aerospace, um, you know, in the Midwest, uh, Michigan, Kansas, uh, also the Southeast, a little bit of California so far. Um, so what's, what's interesting is we benefit great for in, from increased environmental awareness. I would say in manufacturing in the U.S., it hasn't really hit yet. Um, you know, as that, for that being a primary motivator to do things differently, um, the other, I think, change, so, so increased environmental awareness would be a short answer. And then the second is um, a more systems perspective on uh, ROI. So, um, you know, a technology like ours, um, you know, if you look at this as substituting one cutting fluid for another, um, you know, we don't win the economics. But if you look at, okay, we can make products faster, our tools last longer, um, we've eliminated any wastewater treatment operations and cleaning, like then it becomes a no-brainer. And I, I think there, there is, um, again, in Europe and also in Asia, I think there is a bit more of a, um, a systems perspective and that's growing and it's starting to come to the U.S., uh, but you know, it's you know, I think these are the two real trends that that affect our ability to deploy you know, sort of a, a sustainable chemistry, you know, into manufacturing. Thanks. That's a very interesting observation. Again, a, a very uh, well established um, technology and, and workplaces and, and type of facilities and um, how that's impacted the take up of technology like this. Um, Robert, any of your thoughts? What are the trends in the um, sustainable ag space, and um, what thoughts did that spur with you? So uh, I, I'm actually a synthetic organic chemist by training. Uh, so a, a lot of green chemistry is pretty familiar to me. Um, and uh, I, I came out of, uh, I, I guess you would say, the pharmaceutical industry originally, and came to the ag uh, industry from the pharma space. And uh, coming out of that in the 90s to not, I guess you would say, um, uh, I, we saw the pharma industry move from synthetic small molecules broadly to um, biologics. And it moved to biologics because of the regulatory pressures, the toxicity, the unanticipatable um, idiopathic liver tox, say for example, that would emerge in late stage clinical trials that would kill products that had billion dollar potential. And that caused a restructuring of the pharmaceutical industry and the emergence of companies like Genentech, et cetera, uh, an entire industry. Um, I think, we think that you will see that play out in ag and we're already starting to see some of the consolidation of the traditional conventional insecticide manufacturers. Um, and uh, as a result of very similar pressures around regulatory burdens and um, uh, uh, issues around uh, products being launched, 
Um, and, and, and so we think that bringing forward biopesticides as peptides, which is very similar to the antibody space in pharma, um, that this is the beginnings of a new industry in ag around biologics. Um, and uh, uh, we're thrilled <laughs> to be uh, the, the tip of that spear, as it were. <laughs> so uh, it's an exciting time. Um, uh, it, it, it is a bit of a, 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 a wild west um, at this point, um, lots of opportunities. Um, and so that I, I guess I'd, I'd give it that perspective. Yeah, very interesting parallels there. Um, next question, and we do have some partners from state and federal governmental agencies on the webinar. Um, so just talk about a little bit the, the public programs or policies that impacted the development of your technologies. You talked about the regulatory approvals, um, just getting, getting to market and, and overcoming those things. Do you think those policies are well aligned to encourage green and sustainable innovations or um, what, what lessons did you learn about that? So I guess start with you, Steve, if you might. You know, it's interesting. Um, there was a move uh, in the late 90s to um, reduce worker exposure to metalworking fluid aerosols. And there was also a move, or these are proposed moves, to um, uh, strictly limit uh, metalworking fluid disposal to municipal wastewater facilities. And the, you know, I think it was a moment that would have been great for an alternative sort of coolant strategy like Fulent, uh, like uh, Fusion has. Um, because in the end, I mean, we eliminate the um, air quality concerns inside the factory and we eliminate the, the wastewater. Um, however, I mean, this regulation never materialized and it's, it's sort of shocking to me. I mean, I've been doing this for almost 30 years that, um, you know, if you, if you look at the, the research reports on machinists, um, just about any cancer you've heard of and, and more, um, a machinist is more likely to get, and that's due to the exposure of cutting fluid. And there, there just hasn't been a move to do anything about it. And, you know, the, the workers, I never met a worker who likes cutting fluid, uh, you know, and, you know, they know it's necessary, right? Um, you know, I've heard managers call cutting fluid mist the smell of money, right? But it's also the smell of like people getting sick. Um, we've got people employed at, at Fusion who, you know, came to work for us because, you know, they're up at night itching their hands from, from cutting fluids and they could still practice their trade of metal cutting, but they don't have to uh, be exposed to the, the, the uh, dermatological issues. Um, so I would say um, regulation has been disappointing. Um, you know, the, these, the, the environmental impacts are clear. Um, the health impacts are clear, but it's one of these things that we live with. And, you know, therefore, you know, we're talking about sort of um, situations where, you know, the growth in manufacturing has been in non-union um, environments uh, in the U.S. So Michigan struggled a little bit um, in, in terms of that particular issue. So, um, again, it, it brings us back to Europe, you know, and Japan, where folks are, you know, kind of all over these issues. Um, and, you know, for instance, in Europe, there is uh, probably the, the, the group here is familiar with the REACH Directive, um, which in, in terms of cutting fluids eliminates uh, the use of biosats, right? So now, like, you've got, you need a whole new coolant strategy. And, you know, it's, it's an area where, where we can thrive. So... Um, you know, I think we've got work to do in the U.S. I think it might catch up in the next 10 years. Uh, but, you know, I would say not yet in terms of regulatory drivers in the U.S. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Robert, yours, uh, you've had to secure regulatory approval. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, what was that process like and, and was it uh, well, uh, well suited for your product? 
So um, when we first approached the EPA for a regulatory path uh, for our product, um, we, we were a, a first in class and they, I would say that they did not know what to do with us. Uh, and so they had all divisions looking at our product, trying to figure out which division was most appropriate for our product. Um, and we continued down that path for a considerable period of time, ultimately arriving uh, at a place where they decided that we belonged uh, in the BPPD. That's hard to say, but it's the Biopesticide Pollution Control uh, Division. Uh, and, um, uh, and specifically the microbial branch um, of, that, of the BPPD. And so um, the EPA in the United States is probably the most forward looking in the world in terms of um, clearing an appropriate path for risk reduced uh, products in the insect control market. I would say that Europe is doing its best to catch up, um, but it's really in the US where um, the most, I think, evolved thinking has uh, occurred. And uh, the BPPD branch now has moved us over to what they now call um, the Emerging Technologies Branch, a new division that uh, they have uh, created for both us and other companies with analogous technologies such as, for example, RNAi. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I would say that the EPA um, has uh, been actually forward-looking for um, the US um, and, and cleared a path for us. I, I, there is no way that Vesteron would have brought a product to the market uh, with a 300 million or half a billion price tag uh, for all of the talk studies that are really the, 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 the regulatory detritus of bad things that have happened with small molecules, right? And so uh, that not being particularly relevant to our products, which degrade to simple amino acids and not to toxic metabolites, um, and, and which do not have the, the residues that, um, that uh, persist in the environment like uh, many small molecules, um, I, I, I think it has been appropriate regulation, uh, and um, they uh, deserve some congratulations in that regard. Good. Um, thank you for uh, your insights in that, um, you know, kind of both sides of that coin. Um, a couple more questions. I, I wanted to ask your uh, perspective on green chemistry um, or sustainable chemistry in terms of education. You know, both of you uh, work with uh, you know university departments and and are working with students have worked with students um, what have been your takeaways about um, how students view these kinds of issues what is uh, motivating them um, and do they you know they drawn to the same kind of uh, <laughs> exciting um, you know goals that that you share when you talk about you know developing these products um, what would help better develop the next generation talent with green chemistry uh, expertise, because that's something I know that industry is prioritizing in, uh, in those workers. So, Steve? Yeah, I, I, I found um, that, you know, so, so I'm, my, my work sort of the nexus of environmental and mechanical engineering. And um, in terms of student interest, uh, in sustainability generally, um, it is quite high. Uh, the, the, the issue in terms of education is, you know, can you teach sustainability as a class? I mean, you can, you can, you can absolutely teach students about alternative pathways, alternative chemistries, new ways of looking at things. But, um, you know, in the context of a curriculum, you know, and I'll speak from an engineering perspective that, you know, it doesn't, it's not fundamentally different over 100, 150 years. Um, you know, you, you become a class they liked and not a, uh, you know, necessarily a, like a career direction. Um, so, you know, and I view this as a real problem. Uh, because it's systems thinking, holistic evaluation, you know, regardless of the technical depth, um, 
you know, we have to work on that too, the social aspects, the impacts of engineering. You know, a, a lot of students come into engineering at, you know, wanting to make the world a better place. Um, and what they find is, you know, they, they go solve problems with the answers in the back of the book and they're not thinking about stakeholders and, um, you know, they're really just, you know, by the end of it, so beaten down, they just want to go get a job and make money. And then, you know, they sort of follow what their corporations do. So, um, you know, we have to kind of break that down. So uh, one approach to this um, at Michigan, we, we started a center for socially engaged design. Um, and within that, you know, we, we teach sustainability as both a social and an environmental issue, of course. Um, and then we marry that with, you know, performance themes, you know, of which, um, you know, um, uh, sustainable manufacturing, uh, sustainable water systems, sustainable chemistry are, are themes. So um, that's how we've approached it. I think it's just a bigger problem than getting students interested in green chemistry. I think they are. Um, but they're getting mixed signals from curricula. Yeah. Robert, any, any thoughts on that? Uh, so so I, I, I have a relatively limited student contact uh, at this point, um, particularly on the point of green chemistry. I guess I just make the, so, so I'm a synthetic organic chemist by training. And um, uh, uh, I think the, the, and I think younger populations are, uh, certainly very interested in and engaged in uh, more environmentally responsible practices. Um, but, but really it's, it's uh, an, an issue of pointing out where those specific opportunities uh, exist. And I think that here at Vestron, what we have found is that that opportunity exists at the interface between chemistry, um, medicinal chemistry, if you will, and uh, protein chemistry. And what we are doing is we are taking this protein, uh, these pr small, small, mini proteins and translating to that framework, the principles of medicinal chemistry to design new active ingredients that have more um, uh, uh, benign effects on both people and the environment. And, uh, uh, and that's where innovation occurs, right? It always occurs at interfaces. And so uh, helping to identify and highlight uh, the interfaces that make progress against these sustainable and environmentally friendly goals is I think um, the best thing that we can do certainly here at Vestron. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, very, um, very exciting in terms of uh, how you're applying those new principles to those areas. Um, I just wanted to, to wrap up on and thank you both for the time. I wanted to see if you had any final thoughts or where we could go to find out more information about your, um, your enterprises and what you're doing and maybe what's next. Is there something that you are looking for in the next uh, six months or a year? So, Stephen? Yeah, I, you know, the, 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 the supercritical CO2 is a metalworking fluid from fusion coolant is in a lot of ways, a chemistry replacement, right? So you go from, you know, really complicated chemistry to, you know, delivery of, uh, you know, pick your oil, right? Uh, canola oil, um, w you know, and that makes a huge change in the process as, as I've indicated. Um, however, there's a lot more work to do. So, you know, what we need to do now is to understand um, the extent to which, you know, now that the zero order platform chemistry or platform delivery of supercritical CO2 is established, we need to understand how chemistry such as extreme pressure additives, um, and hopefully we can find, you know, more benign ones and some of the chlorinated and, and uh, you know, phosphorus based ones that are out there, um, how they might work in this kind of a system to increase performance further. Um, so that's definitely on, on the research agenda. Um, and we've got work to do to, um, I think, help uh, businesses in Michigan understand that there's an alternative to making their workers sick, you know, uh, which is just a baseline condition of machinists. Um, so I think, you know, as we, we come out of the pandemic, uh, you know, those will be, you know, two very early um, orders of business that sort of intersect with, with this, uh, this group you've assembled, John. Great. Thank you very much. 
and Robert. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you for having, uh, having us on this panel. I greatly enjoyed it. Um, I guess I would say uh, uh, stay tuned to this whole ag space. Um, we predict that it will be transformed just like pharmaceuticals were uh, in a movement away from synthetic small molecules to biomolecules, biopesticides, proteins. Uh, that, that revolution will occur in this space. Uh, it'll be exciting to watch. We fully intend to be a participant or leader of that. Uh, uh, we we uh, uh, hope to be, the, if you will, the Genentech of ag uh, or the Mgen of ag uh, in this space. And that, that revolution is coming to ag. And, you know, and, and watch for who drives it, right? Um, it's not just going to be that whole regulatory pressure issue. It'll probably be consumers. Um, consumers will be uh, insisting on um, uh, products without residues uh, in the grocery store. Uh, and uh, uh, that is going to be a likely driver of this space. The consumer, uh, customer is always right. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, th that's the bottom line. And, and when it comes to, um, maybe the metal workers themselves or the uh, food purchasers, um, they certainly um, would benefit here and uh, you know, find a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to enjoy about the products you brought to market. So I wanna again, just thank you for your time. Uh, we will be posting the, uh, the materials and the, the recording afterwards for people to review. Check out Fusion Coolant Systems, Investoron, the work they're doing. Uh, congratulations on your recognition by EPA and ACS for green chemistry and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.